Hello everyone and welcome to tonight's episode of Beginner Breakdown. My name is Alex Mullering and tonight we're going to do something a little different. Now we're going to be talking about tactics and puzzles and I've done that before. That's not the different part. But tonight the difference is we're just doing it live. So uh, instead of me kind of preparing and pulling things together that I think are going to be useful, whether to work on a specific tactic like a pin or a fork um, or just talking about, you know, tactical signals or positional analysis, we're just going to be doing a bunch of puzzles. And the point of this is there, there's two main reasons. The, the first one is I think it's just a common activity. People like to do puzzles. And so I want to talk you through my approach to it. Uh, and the other thing is just understanding how someone looks out for tactics in any given position. And so how you can apply this not only to just doing puzzles, but also for your own games of chess. So the first example is already on the screen. All of these, again, are not curated by me. It's so I could get it wrong and that'll be a learning experience too. Um, but when you look at a position like this, I want you to take notice of a few things. Uh, we will be, uh, I'm going to kind of walk us through the first handful of them and then we're going to just kind of let it loose to the people in the live audience and the Twitch chat to what your suggestions are and what you think we should be uh, noticing. But when I look at a position, the first thing that's a, maybe a bit of a problem with a puzzle from a learning perspective is, you know, this is just some random position, right? I, I, this is not something that I might find in my own game. And I know there's an answer, right? It, it's presented to me on this website that there's an answer to this puzzle. There's a best move that lets me win or in some weird cases lets me force a draw. And in a real game, I don't know those guarantees for sure. So the first thing you want to do is kind of get accustomed to the position. You want to say, what's going on here? What are the important things to notice? And there's a few things I like to look at first. Kind of the very first thing I look for is material. So um, sometimes on the website, it'll have like a little plus one or plus two for one side being a material, but it's always safe just to count. So here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven pawns for white against one, two, three, four, five, six, seven pawns for black. So pawns are even, those cancel out. Both sides have a knight, both sides have a queen, both sides have a king, and both sides have two rooks. So we can cancel everything out. So material is dead equal. Okay, so the first thing I know is, okay, I'm, I'm doing okay on material. Yes? Is the it is, but we'll talk about why in a second, because there's a few other important things in this position. So first we look at the material, and the second thing I looked out for is tactical signals. Now I've done a few videos on different tactical signals, and I encourage you to check them out. Um, but the main things I'm going to be looking out for here, uh, just kind of the quick summary version, is one, king position, and especially king safety. Two, uh, alignments, so anytime I see pieces lined up in the same row, something like this as well, um, and kind of like knight fork distance, so if there are pieces that I could drop a knight on the board and it would fork multiple pieces, then that's something I notice as well. Um, and so those kinds of things, and if we come into any others like trap pieces or more specifics, we can talk about them as they come up. Um, so we're gonna be looking for those signals. And we're also looking at, you know, just important things you notice about the position. So I noticed that this knight is undefended and attacked, right? That's something I should be aware of. Now, a few people in the chat have suggested and in our live audience, but the move here is queen takes d4. I'm pretty sure we're going to find out. Leeches might tell me I'm wrong. That's our move. Now, if you didn't understand why that was the move, that's okay. And there's going to be a follow up for it. But the first thing I notice in this position, besides the material and the kind of like the hanging knight and those things, is I notice that the king and rook are in fork distance, right? Um, they're right next to each other. And if I could put a knight on e6, for example, I would get a fork. Now we encounter an immediate problem with that. If we try and play knight to e6 right away, the problem, well, there's a knight guarding that square. So we're just gonna lose that piece. And it's just a trade. Now again, material's equal, so maybe that's not the end of the world, but whenever you see an opportunity like a puzzle, you know we should be looking for some advantage or something better than just equality most of the time. So the next question is, well, we want to play this move. It looks really good. And then we and then you can even notice, oh, it's not just forking these pieces, it's also forking the queen. So now that tells us if I can find a way to get rid of this knight, 
even if I have to lose a queen to do it, then I'm going to get a queen back. And that's why queen takes d4 is our move. We sacrifice the queen, and black recaptures, because what else? They've lost a knight, and it's check, so recaptures. And we can follow it up with now knight to e6, because there is no more knight guarding that square. And we can finish it off by taking the queen. And that's kind of the process of, very good, of doing these puzzles. Um, the last thing I want to mention before I move too far on is something else I find really helpful. If you're the kind of person who, again, like if you just like doing puzzles, great. You want to do puzzle rush, you want to kind of run through it, that's totally fine, nothing wrong with that. If you're the kind of person who wants to do puzzles in order to get better at chess just generally, and you are struggling, you know, with some of the things I brought up before about, well, I'm not going to know in a real game if I'm in a puzzle situation or not. One of the nice things you can do, uh, like at least on Lee Chess here, and I think on some other websites too, is you can actually go back in time in the game. So I can see what moves were played that led up to this moment. And in fact, on Lee Chess, I can go all the way back to the very beginning, right? I can go to the very beginning of this game and play it through. Now, you might not play moves this way, but at least doing this might give you some of that context and that feel like, oh, if you take it a little step at a time and say, okay, so what's going on in this position? Why are both sides playing the moves they're playing? And trying to understand it, when you get to that puzzle position, and we're gonna speed ahead, now we're a little closer. We see, okay, so black moves their queen to attack our knight. We push our pawn with a discovered check. Black moves the king and we reached our puzzle position. This can help you out a little bit if you're really struggling with just jumping into some random position and want to understand the context a little more. Okay, let's move on to our next example here. In this position, it is black to move. You can know that because we see the kind of coloration of this square. It means that a piece was on this square and the rook is the other one, so the rook moved from this square to this square. You can also do that by kind of walking back and forth through the game like we did before. Now in this position, there's something else that I notice right away, and that is the phase of the game. Because unlike the previous position, this is very clearly an end game. There's not a lot of pieces left on the board. Uh, it's really only the rooks and kings are the only major pieces left, and then some pawns. So we have different tasks and goals in an end game that we might in a middle game, right? In a middle game, we want our kings to be farther away from the action most of the time, be safe. In an end game, the kings need to be an important part of the fight. So that's already telling us some information. We also know that in end games, if we have either an advantage in material, or in this case, I'm noticing we have a passed pawn right here, that could be valuable, right? I don't actually know the answer to this one yet, I've just looked at it. Um, but in my mind, if we can get the rooks off the board, then this might be a path to victory is walking this pawn home. Again, not so sure. It's a little more complex than that. And so the question is, if I want to promote a pawn and I see an opportunity to trade rooks or win material, that's what I should be looking for. So with all of that in mind, does anyone have any suggestions for what we should do here as black? Okay, rook f3, what's your idea? What is your idea with rook to f3? It is check, but in, remember in a end game, check isn't for its own sake usually so good, right? Because the king doesn't mind being forced to move around. So we only want to call check if it's helping us with something else. Is this move helping with anything else? Not sure? Well, someone in the chat suggested it too, um, and it was actually the first move I've seen. And my thought is there's something in a, there's an alignment going on here of this king and this pawn. This pawn is a backwards pawn; it's unsupported by anything else. And if we can get rid of it, we now have created two passed pawns for ourselves. So that seems pretty useful. Rook to f3, check threatens to play rook takes c3 on the next move which seems really good, right? Winning a pawn in a chess game is already good. If you can win a pawn in an end game, that's sometimes the difference between winning and losing. So this looks good, and this is what I would qualify as a forcing move. So again, a forcing move, I've done a few lectures on this as well, but the short and sweet version is, 
it's any move that forces your opponents to respond immediately. Now they can sometimes have a number of options for how to do that, um, but a check is a great example because anytime you call check, the opponent has to respond to the check. They can't let their king stay in danger. Sometimes they can move out of the way, sometimes they can take the piece that's calling check or block it, but they have to do something about it. And in this case, this is our forcing move, what do you think white is going to play here? Probably d2, right? Because they don't want to lose the pawn. So this is a good forcing move. If they go to uh, probably to e2 or to e4, the only other legal moves, then it seems reasonable that we're just going to play rook takes c3 and have two nice passed pawns and it will be very hard for white to come back from. So it seems like after rook to f3, the king is going to go to d2. Now the question here with our forcing moves is do we have any good follow-ups from there? How might you continue from this position? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So then we'll be able to exchange and then the king, the black king can get between those two pawns because if you just simply go from those pawns on the A and B file, they could possibly create a pass pawn as well. Yeah, so I like the way you're thinking here. So we have another forcing move, right? So we're going to play rook to f2, or rook f3 check, king goes to d2, and the rook now moves to f2 with check, and the king has to move to c1, right? If it goes anywhere else, or sorry, from here. If it goes anywhere else than c1, then we just win a rook. Um, and we have the option to exchange, and your argument is we should exchange because then we have like better pass pawns, and um, yeah, this makes a lot of sense to me. The one piece I'm a little concerned with is can our king successfully infiltrate after we trade rooks? Like I'm looking at this path and trying to think if this works, if we have time, and are we in any danger from these pawns? Because there is a pawn majority against our one pawn here. Uh, so there's a few things to think about, right? I do think we're on the right track. It doesn't seem like there's any other very clear way to make progress. So I like to generally, when I do a puzzle, try and figure out the whole thing in my head. But in some more complicated puzzles, it's also okay just to kind of give it your best shot once you're pretty confident on the first thing and you want to see how your opponent responds. So let's give it a try and see if we're correct with rook to f3 check. King actually plays to e4. So the, the, the computer probably just does not like this end game of trading down and thinks it's just lost. Um, and here I'm going to guess we just want to take this pawn. That seems like the reason we played our move. And okay, they push a pawn here. My instinct, again, we can take time, and probably if you're trying to get rating on <laughs> puzzles, you should take more time, but uh, it seems to me that we can just take this. Maybe there's a check, but like I don't think they're winning anything, so I'm probably just going to take this. Yeah, there's a check, but again, I don't think they're winning anything so long as we defend the pawn, and the puzzle is done. Now, the other thing here that's really important uh, in this one is that I wasn't one I wasn't hundred percent confident so it was good to nice have our reasoning confirmed but also he played a move that we weren't expecting right the the line that seemed the di most difficult to prove in my opinion was if the king goes back this way and we trade rooks because then I have to calculate a king and pawn endgame and make sure it works so if you ever get to a situation like this and the computer just says well everything else is losing so I guess I'm playing this move um, I think it's always important to go back and go through those lines we missed. So let's imagine that this is played. Uh, I can, now my plan is to turn on the computer and compare it to what we said, right? Because our idea was we're going to play rook to f2. We're going to either win the rook or exchange them. And then our king's going to try and infiltrate somewhere. Computer says rook to f2 is minus 8. Everything else is about equal. So rook to f2. Um, here again, I'm going to guess that yeah, king to c1, you have to play it. And again, our, our line, um, rook to f1 also works because we can force the trade to happen again. Rook to f1 is kind of a funny computer move, I think, because it's giving the opponent the most chances to give us the rook for free. <laughs> 
But if we're going to assume our opponent is not a fool, then probably is safe enough to just take the rook. And here I am not going to turn on the computer because we were kind of debating two ideas, uh, at least in the chat it seems. One was to come this way to b6 and a5 and either win or uh, just block blockade these pawns. And the other was the one I suggested first, which was to run this way and try and infiltrate somewhere in the center. And looking at it more, I'm actually siding a little more myself with this b6 idea now because white has too many things to do. Initially, I thought, well, if we go this way, then they can maybe just defend. But there's two problems. Is one, we can waste moves. We can just play moves, and eventually their king is stuck. They can't defend this pawn, because our pawn covers this square. So if they ever, like, let's just imagine something like this happens. If we just play a move, they have to move their king or give up a pawn. The other problem is more Simple, it's just, well, this pawn is going. <laughs> you have to stop it. So they don't actually have time to defend any of this uh, because if we run this way, they still have to deal with this pawn. And even if we let them get in really far, by this point, it's too late. We've made another threat. So I, this seems to be the right idea. Um, now I will again check with the computer to be sure. Yeah, king to b6. Uh, you can also just push this pawn right away and then switch to this idea, maybe even play king to d5, but I don't think if you're doing this, you're trying to run this way. Um, yeah, let's say they just go here. Yeah, uh, we have to go back. So w w that kind of idea. And again, this is the kind of thing where you don't have to have seen all of this when you were prepping the puzzle or working through it, but I find it really helpful to either confirm or challenge my ideas about what I thought the position was more so than just, oh, I got the puzzle right. Like, that's great, but also, what if they did something different? Okay, here's our next puzzle. We have another endgame puzzle. This one even more endgame-y of an endgame. Very few pawns, very few pieces, just one rook and one pawn on each side. Um, now, the benefit we have is our pawn is much closer, right? We are one square from promotion. Black's is three. Does anyone have any ideas for what we should do? Um, so, El Zach, I actually don't know the rating of these puzzles. I, I just went to like a non-signed in Lee Chess account. Um, so it's whatever their default one is. I think they default to like 1500 question mark. So it's, pro and I, it's probably a little easier than that, I would guess. All right, so uh, a few suggestions in the chat. The first one that most people are saying is rook to a8. And this is the thing that also jumps to my mind, right? It's a forcing move, it's a check, and it puts our rook on the right line to defend the promotion square once we eventually push this pawn. I think that's really important. Another thing with this type of puzzle is I also will imagine if in some strange world we like traded everything down and traded the rooks, is my king able to stop this pawn? Am I in the box? And in this case, the answer is no, right? We think about the boxes when it's the king's turn to move. If you drew a, a box from the pawn diagonally to the edge of the board and you just kind of make this box, if the king can step into it, then he can catch the pawn. So in this case, I know that uh, there's no way for me to catch this pawn if it just runs. So we have to find another kind of solution. We can't just bank on that. Um, but the suggestion is we check and it's a forcing move. So we think, what does the king play in this case? Only one legal move, we, oops, we cover every other square. The king is going to have to go to h7. Um, and then, yes, from there we can just see, we actually don't even need to promote the pawn, as some people in chat have realized. Uh, promoting the pawn actually, I think, is probably lost. So let's walk through it and kind of talk through how we got there. Check and checkmate. If we had tried to promote the pawn, uh, then the problem is black now trades everything down and remember we aren't close enough to catch the pawn So we are going to be just one move too short and actually lose this game um, So we were kind of saved by that checkmate I originally thought the idea might be we call some check and force the king to like walk in front of the rooks connection But it wasn't that complicated because we're actually just 
able to cover all of the relevant squares and call a checkmate. So again, this is another example. This happens a lot with puzzles because they all, you know, it, they can't just say, oh, here's a position where you have 17 good moves. It's usually you have a good move. Maybe you have a move that draws, but probably everything else is bad. Um, and so a lot of the time, like very forcing moves like checks or captures are the moves to look out for. There are ones with quiet moves, but those are much more rare, usually much more advanced and often because of that much harder. Okay, let's look at our next position here. All right, so feel free to suggest moves, but also feel free to just uh, tell me what you notice about the position. What seem like relevant factors for what we should be looking for and considering as we try and find the best move here for white. Uh, yeah, I think it probably is. Um, Cody, real quick, again, the, I'm not entirely sure the specific rating because all I've done is go into uh, just Lee Chess on a unsigned in account. Like I'm not signed in, I'm just kind of on the default browsing version and just doing puzzles randomly there. So it's whatever its default setting is to. Um, but yeah, so the we your suggestion was queen to g4 with what's your idea? Checkmating. Checkmating, I love the idea. How are you gonna do it? And actually, if the king goes to h8, it's checkmate too, right? Because our knight covers this square. So the things you might notice when you look at this position, right? Again, really quick, just to walk through. We won't take as much time with all of them. Is what I notice is we're in a middle game, uh, right? Both sides are castled. I notice immediately that my opponent's castle is kind of wrecked, right? So king safety is something that I want to watch out for. And this king is not safe. As we can see from we have a very clear check. The fact that our knight is very close to the king also contributes to the king being not safe, right? It's not just that they don't have pieces in the way or defending, it's also we have pieces that are taking up space and actively controlling areas. And so that's what allows this nice mate in two. Um, other things you might notice, you might notice the knight is hanging, but again, in chess when tempo and forcing moves are all that matters, we don't have to immediately take that into account, we can deal with it later. And uh, yeah, so I think king safety is really the big thing here, right? One of the first things you want to notice in any position is, is my king safe? Is my opponent's? And so we got this nice queen to g4. And again, doesn't matter where they went because our knight covers this square and it's checkmate either way. All right, here's our next one. It is white's turn to move. Feel free to suggest moves, but also maybe even more helpfully, feel free to suggest uh, just things you notice that seem important in the position. All right, Elzac, I like your suggestion and Berlinator same, but why? What is it about that move you like? Mm -hmm. Yes. Very nice. So a lot going on here, but we can let's break it down really simply. The move suggested by several people is e5. And the nice thing about this is, right, there's not a lot going on. We have right our king is castled and our knight is out, um, but most of our pieces are back here. So uh, this is more of an opening almost. We would want to get them developed, but we have this nice tactical opportunity. We can play e5 and fork the bishop and knight. And so we're going to win one of them for our pawn. Now, whenever you look at a piece that is attacked or defended or those types of things, I like to just count, right? So I can say, okay, if I put my pawn here, it's going to be defended once by my knight, and it's going to be attacked twice by the bishop and queen. Normally, that means it's not defended enough, right? I'm outnumbered. But there's a bit of a trick here, because we also see there is an alignment between the queen and the, the king, that because they're on the same line and because we are castled, that if we go through that forcing exchange in the center, then we can finish it off by sliding our rook over and getting a pin on the queen. And so we will, even if we lose uh, 
a little bit of material, like a rook or the knight or whatever, we're going to win the queen, and that's going to be well worth it. So pawn to e5, bishop takes, knight takes, and queen takes, rook to e1. And here, no matter what you do, um, you're losing material. Probably... I don't know if it's better if you're black here just to take the rook, or like maybe there's an argument to be made of playing knight to e4. Um, you're still going to lose the material, right? Imagine they play knight to e4. How might you continue as white? Yeah, pawn f3 looks very natural. Uh, maybe you might play like knight here too, because you can always follow it up with f3, but I think both are good. Um, Yeah, it doesn't it, this doesn't hurt anything, right? There's no tricks of them moving and there's no checks or anything. So just developing with some attacks, I think this all looks good. And we're eventually going to win this piece. And if black's not careful, um, we might also just win the queen anyway. Um, the other thing I notice here is this is like very early in the game. So something I sometimes do is see, was well, this like an opening trap or did someone make a blunder? How did we get to this position? Because the puzzle started at move seven so this is the kind of thing where you might play through and say is this the opening i play like if you play e4 e5 which is very very common for white and black you might say well let me take a look and see if there's something i play i as white still play all of these moves um, i do not play the italian or the or sorry i don't play the spanish or the roy lopez so this is where it would not be as applicable for me but it's still good to know generally what happened here so uh, and if you do play you would obviously want to know takes takes pawn to d3 and bishop d4 and so i see the pawn was kind of lured off of this square when the king castles and we have this opportunity so maybe a little bit of a miss of just white being very rapid with their development uh, prioritizing getting the king safe and being able to develop this rook so again if that's an opening you play on either side it's going to be more relevant for you to know what to try or what to avoid perhaps um, obviously, again, you compare that against computer and opening books, but something I like to take note of. Okay, let's jump to the next example here. All right, this one, it's white to move. Black's last move was pawn g7 to g5. What do you notice? What do you see? And I'll kind of talk through what I see as well. I'm noticing we're in a middle game here. Um, not quite an end game because queens are on the board and kings are sort of trying to be safe. Okay, f takes g5. What's your reasoning? You may not take the bishop. Very good. So we see there is an alignment here and a hanging piece, right? Hanging pieces or unprotected pieces, another one of our tactical signals. We see this bishop is not defended by anything. We see this queen is lined up with it. So this looks like a pin, right? The bishop is pinning the pawn. It shouldn't be able to move because we're going to lose our queen. But something I like to say is a bad pin is just a discovery waiting to happen. And in this case, this bishop is pinning, but it's not well supported. And the fact that we can move the piece that is pinned with check means that you have to deal with the forcing threat and don't have time to keep the bishop alive. Um, yeah, so we're going to get this piece. We might even win this one, right? It's possible if, you know, black isn't careful, we might also win this one. And the king is still very, very exposed. Um, what if king f7 instead of rook g5? That's a good question. Let's take a look. So if we take the pawn, and this is the kind of thing you can just play out, but it's also helpful to try and do it in your mind. So f takes g5, and then the king goes to, you said, f7. So I'm suggesting e7. So f7, I think we still just take, because even if they take our knight, we can then take their bishop. So we're going to get these two pieces for this one and maybe the pawn. Um, king to e7 looks a little more concerning because now they're defending the bishop. So what might we do against that? We take and they play king to e7. Are we in trouble? Any ideas? What do you think we should do? Yeah, 
Zach, I like your thinking, as well as with you, Monsignor. Um, the king, notice on this square, right, the problem we're maybe a little worried about is in this position, and I'll just put it on the board now, we notice our queen is attacked, but our knight is also attacked, right? We have to keep our queen somewhere defending the knight. So I think there's a few reasonable moves. Um, the one suggestion that's coming from a few people is we can play knight to g6 check, which frees the knight from danger. Um, there's, again, considerations of, well, what if they move to attack it, but any time they move their king out of the way, we're going to pick up the bishop, and even if they get the knight. The thing to remember about this whole variation is all of this started with us taking this pawn. So, like, at the absolute worst, we just want a pawn. At the absolute worst, so long as we don't give up another piece. But even if we wanted to be, you know, more careful, uh, you could just, you know, maybe move the queen back out of the way, continue to defend the knight. Um, uh, this looks really enticing to me because, again, it's forcing the king to step away from this bishop. And again, we have threats of maybe even winning a second one. So this seems quite reasonable to me. Now, again, none of that was part of the puzzle, so I like to confirm that with the computer. If the king goes to f7, then knight to g6. Now, interestingly, queen to f2 is not good. Why is that? Well, okay, taking another closer look, what's the, one of the first things I said we should do is look at the material count. And we notice here, black's got a bishop pair against our knight. So we want to win something, right? We don't just want to not let anything happen, because if they just take back the pawn, then black is quite happy. So this makes a lot of sense. We want to play knight to g6 to force the king away. We can take, and then if they take, we're getting another one, so we win the piece back, and we're still in a really strong position. Their king is in danger. And if they don't take our knight, like they move the bishop somewhere, maybe, then, well, okay, well, then we just have apparently a mate in two, but even if we didn't, you get the idea. Okay, our next example here, new puzzle. Okay, weird first move. So it's black to move, and we notice that bishop to c3 is played. And it looks weird to me because I'm like, well, that gets taken, but we know, okay, well, there's some rooks lined up against us. So we need to think, maybe it's not such a bad move, but this is also a puzzle, so maybe it's not such a good move. <laughs> yeah, rook takes f5 from the previous one. It's kind of, kind of wild. Computers are nutty. Don't always use them. I mean, they're... It's good information, but don't feel weird if you don't like see all the, the moves the computer sees. Okay, so what is important about this position? Uh, again, what I'm noticing is, let's start with the material here, one, two, three, four, five, versus one, two, three, four, five. Pawns are equal, knight versus bishop, two rooks versus two rooks, so it's dead even, just an imbalance of the knight versus the bishop. Um, and we can make an argument about which one is better, right? When you're trying to evaluate like an imbalance like that, you want to think of the value of the pieces, not just in a vacuum, but in the position. So bishops thrive in positions with open lines, right? Where they can attack on long diagonals across the board. You also want to note the color complex with the bishop. So by this point where we're in a middle game or maybe even an end game, noticing like, okay, well, our Black's pieces on dark squares mostly, or light squares, or is it mixed? Because if all my pieces are on light squares, this bishop is just useless. And if all my pieces are on dark squares, it maybe is a monster. Um, versus knights prefer positions that are more closed, right, where the bishops can't navigate as cleanly across the board. Um, but in this case, I don't know that any of that really matters for our puzzle. It's just something good to think about for the material. Um, okay, so... The first thing to look at is kind of our forcing moves, right? Pawn takes bishop, but I think we can pretty clearly establish that this isn't so good because there's a pin on that pawn, right? And even if there's ideas of like, are we gonna maybe promote in time? We are always one move too short, right? So we can imagine if pawn takes, rook takes, rook takes, rook takes. We're not threatened of a back rank, so we don't have to worry about that. But we do have to worry that even if we get a pawn to the second rank, um, the rook can always stop it, right? So if we take, the rook can just go all the way back. And if we push, a little trickier, right? Where the rook now can't just come back because it gets taken, uh, we can still just put the rook behind the pawn. And because we've lost all of our rooks as black, white's totally fine there. So we can't try any trading shenanigans. The other move that uh, a lot of people here are suggesting is knight to f4. 
This also looks very good. It's also a forcing move, right? The most forcing we can be most of the time is like a check um, or a capture, but this move is a threat, right? We're threatening to take a, net, a rook with a knight, which is a win material situation. You don't really want to let that happen unless you have to as the opponent. Um, so that feels good. It also feels good that we're adding a defender to this rook. So now maybe our pawn's not pinned and we have the opportunity to take over here. So this looks really good. The question is, how does white respond? Do they have any moves they can play that cause us a problem? Okay, rook d3 to d2. Well, you, let me ask you why they don't. Let's start with that. So why? what's wrong with, because uh, it looks like this. the point of this move is we've now piled three pieces on and there's only two defenders. So why doesn't that work anymore if they just take? Because the knight can go to um, what is that? E check, e three. Mm -hmm. We have a nasty fork. Um, and whether you do it right away or to start trading first, I'm not sure the nuances of which one might be better. I'd have to look closer, but we have this really beautiful fork. So the knight's just kind of a monster on this square. It's defending, it's attacking, and it's making a major threat. This is very strong. So the question then is, okay, well, what if they don't take the bait and just back off? And yeah, Zach, I think you have the right idea, right? So there's something essential that's changed as we kind of pointed out before. The fact now that our knight defends the rook means our pawn isn't pinned. So we're actually, with knight f4, we're making two, arguably three threats. One is we're threatening, if they capture, we're threatening to make this fork. That's kind of the potential one because they don't have to capture. But the two threats that are very real, one, we're threatening to just take a rook, and two, by defending the rook ourselves, we're threatening to take the bishop. So if they just play their waiting move, right, and I think we can say this is safely the move. Uh, they just decide to move the bishop out of the way, and we're just going to take this, and they can take back, but now we're up material. Had they instead played rook 2d2, then yeah, our idea is just we just capture the bishop, and even if they win the pawn back, Still, we're a material in this end game. Uh, I also love this position as black because this is a position where a trade is forced. There's, they might not have to trade everything, but they can't get out of it, right? Because if they just move the rook away, well, now we're just winning a piece. So they have to at least trade one of their rooks and then they can kind of figure it out from there. And anytime you can liquidate material in a position where you're ahead is going to be good. Um, and again, I feel really confident with everyone's assessments there, but we can always check against the computer. And yeah, so D takes is the move. And had they taken, then yes, this fork is the problem. Okay, well, let's look at our next one. Again, hopefully this is helpful to you. We're trying to learn from puzzles and you know learn from these positions, but also just the process of when you encounter a puzzle or just encounter any position, what kinds of things do you want to look out for to try and solve it? So here we have black to move. White's last move was pawn to g3, which is really interesting because there's like a threat of taking a rook and lots of stuff going on. So this is one of the ones that I even like to back up and say, okay, well, why did you play this move? Why do we think white played g3 as their last move? Yeah, there's a back rank, right? If if they don't, this king is stuck, right? It doesn't matter that this is a knight and not a pawn. It It's still impeding the king's view. And so if you place any other move, then just queen to d1 is made. So g3 is opening up an escape square and creating now this threat. So how do we continue from here? Yeah, a few moves are jumping out, right? So again, what I'm noticing... First, let's, the material is three pawns versus four pawns. We've got knight and bishop versus knight and bishop. Two rooks versus two rooks and a queen. Our pieces are kind of terrible, truthfully. Like, we, I think we lucked into this position because our pieces are not coordinated at all. Um, or not developed at all, I should say. But the pieces we have on the board are very co coordinated. 
um, because of some maybe king safety issues. So it doesn't really matter, funny enough, that our rook is attacked. It doesn't matter that all of white's pieces save this rook are pretty active. Um, we have some problems. And the problems are, you're suggesting bishop h3. What's your idea? Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. Really nice. So the problem with this is it's all about king safety and it's this back rank threat, right? Back ranks are, you know, again, often just you see like in the books, the three pawns and the king. But the important thing with a back rank is to say, okay, well, the king's on the back row. That matters because if we can attack the whole back row and there's nowhere forward for him or her or it to safely step, um, then it's checkmate. So it doesn't matter if it's three pawns. It doesn't matter if it's some of their own pieces. It doesn't matter if it's our pieces attacking those squares. It all kind of counts as that back rank family. And so bishop h3 is a really beautiful move because if you block, then your bishop steps in the way and takes up that square. And we can now call checkmate. Had the king step to the side, then it's the same thing. You can call checkmate actually in two different ways uh, because there's our bishop controlling this square now. And sadly, this knight is actually doing a terrible job of defense because if it's not in the way, then uh, the queen can actually maybe jump in now. It doesn't matter so much because of our bishop. But had they cho chosen to block, right? If, uh, I guess this still doesn't matter because it can't hit it. So their pieces are just really discoordinated, which is kind of funny. Uh, okay, let's jump to our next one here. Okay, it's white to move, and black just took a piece on b5 with the queen. So again, feel free to suggest moves or just comments on what seem to be the relevant pieces of the position that we should kind of hone in on here. All right, in this position, queen d6 has been suggested. This is a nice check, right? Um, and actually, I think that's just straight up checkmate. <laughs> now that I look at it more. So queen d6, sometimes check. It might be mate, right? This is a good rule of thumb to follow, uh, especially if you are low on time. Just play a check, right? It might be mate, and at least that way you avoid stalemate. That's kind of funny. Um, so we don't have to spend a ton of time here, but important thing to notice, right, is again, king safety, right? This king is, you know, it feels safe. It's on the back rank. It's got some defenders around it. Um, but our pieces, like our knight is just controlling so much space by this opponent's king. It's really hard to avoid that. So king safety is not just about, you know, an opponent's king being exposed, as I said before. It's also about our pieces being active and able to make threats. And yeah, queen d6 is a very funny checkmate in one, just covering every square really beautifully. Not too much else I think needs to be said here. All right, this position, it is black to move and rook to f2 was the last move played defending this knight that is under threat mm -hmm. yeah and again this is like a harder one to see i think if you're like really a beginner is to say well if rook takes um this looks so crazy because you're like, well, why would I ever sacrifice a rook for a knight? And again, uh, the thing with these positions, the way to find this more organically is to again, notice these kind of signals. So one, I noticed the, the position of the king, right? It looks relatively safe, but we do have a move that calls check, knight to f3. Anytime you have a move, we also have uh, rook to c1. So anytime you have a move that calls check, doesn't mean the king is in danger per se, Right, there's plenty of times where you can call check and it doesn't mean anything. But it's something to be aware of to say, if I needed to make an attack real quick, I could. And that's quite valuable in a lot of these positions. Um, 
And then we notice, well, what are the reasons I can't do this? Well, one, the rook defends, and two, the knight defends, right? So the knight can just take. But when you see that those are the only problems with that move, and we have the ability with a capture, right, a forcing move, to lure a piece to uh, the opponent's, like, to a square you want. This is called, I believe, attraction, where you attract a piece to an undesirable square. Then we can find these really beautiful tactics, where in one move you can see this quite obviously, right? It's so simple when you're like, oh, um, I just see the pattern. There's a beautiful knight fork right here. But it's harder to see, like it's a lot harder to see in this position, even though it's really just one move away. And that's because there's a lot of clutter on this position, right? We get rid of both of these pieces and everything clears up. But starting to look for those signals, I think it's really, really useful. Okay, uh, we have time for a handful more, so let's give it a shot. It is white to move, and rook to c5 was the last move played by black. What seems important to notice here? There's a few things that immediately jump out at me, but I'm actually not seeing the obvious immediate solution, which is good. Mm. Yeah, I think you have the right idea, Zach, but what do we notice? What's important to notice here? King's in the center of the board, right? So my first thought was, is there a checkmate, right? Um, I'm looking and saying, okay, well, I control a lot of these squares, right? Uh, and you have pieces on some of the other ones. The problem is, there's not really, there's two problems. One, there's not a great way to call check. And two, this king also has this escape square that seems kind of hard to deal with. Um, so, like, we have some checks, but it didn't seem like we're actually going to find a checkmate uh, from this, right? Black's rooks are enough to hold us off. So the next thing we look for is unprotected pieces, right? That's another one of our signals or alignments or some of these other things. Um, but uh, Zach in the chat made this really good point that this rook is perilously uh, protected, right? Uh, there, there's different ways to express this idea, but and you can get a deeper dive in my kind of lecture on tactical signals. But, or hanging pieces. But the idea here is when you're looking for a piece that is unprotected, sometimes you can also look for a piece that is insufficiently protected. And what we mean by that is look at this rook on d6. No pieces are protecting it, so, but also no pieces are attacking it. So it's just kind of like a neutral piece. If we had a way to attack it quickly with like a forcing tactic or something, then it's a potential liability for black. But this rook counts in the same way because even though it has one protector, it also has one attacker already on it. So if we add that extra attacker or move that extra defender tactically, then the result is the same. We can treat it like an unprotected piece. And because we have this really uh, beautiful way to, this is I think the opposite. So last time we talked about attraction, where we pulled a piece to a square that was undesirable so we could punish that piece. In this case, we're going to do deflection, which we pull a piece to an undesirable square away from another key piece, right? In the last one, it was this, uh, we pulled this rook to an undesirable square to fork it and win that piece. In this case, uh, oops, this one. Oh, no. No, I should have solved it first. Um, but in that position, if you can kind of recall it in your mind, the idea was we can push the pawn up. I think the king was like here. We pushed the pawn up to attack the king, and the king was going to be pulled away, not defending that rook anymore, and we would then take it. Sorry I didn't solve that one, but you guys got the answer here. Okay, this is our position. It is black to move, and white's last move was a4, which is kind of revealing to me that either white sees nothing else good to do in this position, or they see that, well, I have a threat of just winning the game if you don't stop me, so stop me. So, let's stop them. What can we do from here? Okay. 
All right, so rook e2 has been suggested. What is the idea with this move? Okay, why? Yeah. Yes. So rook to e2 is a really nice tactical idea. So this is actually a fork. Um, it doesn't look like it, but it is. And the idea here is to think, uh, we often think of like a fork as, oh, I'm attacking two pieces. Like I'm attacking a king and I'm attacking a, a rook or I'm attacking two rooks or something like that. Uh, but you can also attack key squares. And uh, the back rank here counts as that key square, right? If we have a way to infiltrate the back rank safely, uh, this king is just dead in the water. And so in with rook to e2, we are forking the queen and e1. Now there is a complication here because the argument is, oh, well, if we just pull the queen away from the e file, then we can just play queen or rook either way to the square. But what if after rook to e2, say they play something like queen to b4? which defends the back rank. Yeah, the pro so there's two problems. One, it's this fork, right, where we fork the back rank and the queen. But there's a second problem, is this queen is overworked. She has to now defend both the back rank and there's already this nice threat of our pieces lined up and dominating the second, uh, second rank. And so we have a threat of just playing queen takes g2 and just giving the kiss of death to the white king here. And so whatever they choose, in this case, they just choose to sacrifice the queen, which again, I mean, this is actually the best move. It makes sense by the computer because now we still have to prove we can win an end game of rook and knight and pawn versus queen. So like this is the practically right way to play. Um, we should still win as black here without too much trouble because the rook has to guard the back rank row and help navigate this pawn. And there's no way this knight is contributing much. But again, we can see that had this not been played right, there's no way to defend the back rank securely because now we switch our threats to the second rank. And if just some other move, if, if the queen maintains defense of this pawn, then now we can either drop the queen or the rook. Probably the queen is more stylish. So let's do that one in order to get our back rank. Okay, our next example here, it looks like very little has shifted, um, just uh, back to an end game, just rooks and pawns on the board. And white has played pawn to d5, threatening to infiltrate very, very close to our, uh, our back rank. How should we continue as black? So uh, yeah, Zach is arguing again for a check and in this case to exchange the rooks and then we can even take on d5. Now the question is why would you want to exchange the rooks in this position, right? It's very clear that that's a possibility, right? But why would that be helpful? Because I actually, it looks like, I'm not sure. Our king might be close enough to defend the pawn but white's king also might be close enough to get back to it. We have a better structure. Um, I agree with that. And even if we can't, you know, say this one, we definitely can win this pawn. We probably can do both. But white's got to deal with this problem of this past pawn. So in these types of end games where you have like a king and rook and some pawns versus a king, rook and some pawns, often the winner is going to be who's more active. In this case, white is arguably more active, right? They're Maybe their rook isn't doing so much at the moment, but their pawns are farther forward. Their king is certainly more active than ours. And so if we can force them to give some of that up, right? If we can trade the rooks, we have to lure their king all the way to the edge of the board to defend, then their king loses its activity. It also loses the defense of this pawn. And we have time to activate our own king. So in this position, I think liquidation makes a lot of sense. And if we don't, if we try and like, if we just get greedy and take this pawn, now we might be in a lot of trouble after something like d6. Maybe, 
maybe pawn takes, but probably just pushing. Um, this looks a little scary to me. So yeah, I love this idea. Let's give it a shot. Rook to h5, more check. We trade, and now we take on d5. And again, if you get to this position and you're like, well, what's the point of the, how am I winning this game? Um, feel free to continue to puzzle it out from here. Feel free to use computer assistance to help you understand the position. Um, it seems like Yeah, it seems like white might be getting to this pawn first. So let's see, yeah, let's take a look. What's the re... Oh, because we can also run. So we can force white to lure their king farther away. This makes sense. And we can also just straight up win this one. So again, if you don't understand a position totally, that's fine. I just recommend, yeah, using, uh, using your resources to, to give it a check. All right, uh, we probably have time for one or two more. So let's see if we can end on a good note here. It is black to move. White has just played queen to f4. What do we notice here? Right, we can look at the material. Looks like one, two, three, four. White, I think, is up a pawn, but it's a doubled pawn. But they also have a passed pawn. That seems valuable to know. A whole bunch of alignment going on on the uh, F file here. We got rook, queen, rook, knight, a bunch of pawns. So there's maybe some stuff to notice with that. Um, someone says queen is undefended. This is an important thing to notice. I think often that doesn't matter so much because when we're looking for like tactics of is the queen defended or not, that only ever matters in a situation where we're looking at a queen trade, right? Because if the queen is attacked by any piece other than a queen, most of the time it doesn't want to get captured at all and so it's always just going to move but in this case because our queens are kind of in the same alignment that could matter right because it doesn't it doesn't so much matter if we're able to you know trade queens but if we can attack it without them having time to respond that could be quite valuable so i'm noticing yeah i, I agree that seems important uh, we have to be a little bit careful of our back rank. We have enough defenders right now, but there is, you know, a check to watch out for. So that seems to be the immediate stuff to notice. And with that, what do we want to do? Okay, knight to h4 check seems pretty strong, right? What's the idea? Mm -hmm. so, yes. Yeah, and that basically sums it up. So we have a discovered attack because of our alignment here. We have a discovered attack. If we move this knight, the queen is hit. And we have a place we can move it safely, right? Uh, our queen defends, so we're able to recapture here. Uh, but even if they choose not to do that, because this queen is not defended, we can take, and the queen actually will get defended in this line sometimes, right, if the king goes up, but it still doesn't matter because it's not defended enough. We have two pieces of firepower against just the king, and so we can continue to step forward. Oh, and that's also a checkmate. I didn't realize that, but our knight covers the exit. That's kind of funny. All right, let's finish out with one more good one. We won't analyze this one super deep, but let's put everything we've learned to the test. It is black to move. What should we do? I have some ideas, but I'm not sold on this one. Yeah, some suggestions that we just push a3. The question is, like this pawn is close to promotion. If we can make a new queen or force it to the pawn to trade off for like the rook or something, we're doing well. Question is, does white have any resource to try and stop our pawn promotion here? The only move I think that looks a little challenging is maybe queen takes c4. And now the queen is preparing to defend the rook to go to a4 and kind of cut us off. 
So do we have any good way to respond to that? Okay, Zach makes a good point. We always have our eye on this e5 pawn. So if the queen ever goes away, we can always take this with check. That looks good. I don't know if it's enough to win, but it looks really good. A3 rook takes. Interesting. Yeah, I wonder if you have it with queen back to f5. We make if we can make our queen right. We take take. But do you have? Yeah, you make a good argument. Well, I'll tell you what. Uh, we, we have queen take on e5. But what if the rook takes? Yeah, I don't think that. All right, people are saying a lot of ideas. And I would love to continue exploring this position. But I also want to <laughs> leave time for our grandmaster in residence uh, Melek to give it a shot. So let's just see what happens. Let's push a3. Computer likes that. Queen takes on c4. Seems like maybe we just take on e5 check. No. We continue to push. And now we take... Oh, we just make a queen and defend. Yeah, that's smart. That's funny. You know, so even the... I'm not a pro, but even people like me mess these puzzles up, and it's very funny. So if you saw that in the chat, well, well done. Please stick around. Thank you for coming to Beginner Breakdown, but please stick around for our Grandmaster's Choice with Grandmaster Melek. Uh, we're super excited to have him here. Uh, winner of US Senior Champs. So uh, hope to have you all stick around and have a great evening.